Hello, my name is Rick Houston, and welcome to the Scene Vault Podcast, your source for all things NASCAR history. Presented by QWare. Maintain excellence. When I look back on my career and I look back at some of the things I said and did, uh, I'd probably had to whip that guy's ass, I'm just telling you. The day NASCAR and all of us associated in any way with NASCAR forget its past, that's the day we don't have any future. DW, you ran your first several cup races in 1972, 1973. Was there a specific moment or race when you felt like you'd made it in the sport, or was that something that developed over time? Well, I, I tell you what was amazing. Uh, I had that Mercury. Uh, I bought that Mercury from Holman and Moody. I didn't know at the time. Um, uh, it was a 69 Mercury when I bought it from Holman Moody. I didn't know until Jake Elder came to work for me that it was actually the car uh, that Mario Andretti had won the Daytona 500 in. It, it started out its life as a 67 Fairlane. Of course, you know, back in those days, you just put a different body on it or update the body or whatever. So I bought it, it was a 69 Mercury. I wrecked it. I took it over to Hutchin Pagan, and they turned it into a 71 Mercury Cyclone like the Woods Brothers run. And my first race was Talladega. People always say, well, why did you choose Talladega? Because that's when we got the car done. So the <laughs> car was ready to go. The yeah. next race was Talladega. So we went to Talladega, which ironically was the last place that uh, Holman Moody had run that car with uh, a guy named Ralph Stallman, I believe his name was, qualified third or fourth. Uh, and something happened to the car and they fell out of the race. But anyway, bought the car, went to Talladega. Uh, Jake Elder, I rented him from Hutchin Pagan. He was working over there. Uh, he had been at Petty's and he came and worked in the shop at Hutchin Pagan. I needed somebody to help me. So Dick Hutchinson, who fixed the car for me, put the 71 body on it for me, said, Jake knows a car. Jake's a crew. He's been a crew chief. Why don't you take him with you? And he'll help you stay out of trouble. I said, great. So Jake is my crew chief. We go to Talladega. I had gone down to, I lived, uh, my father-in-law lived in Owensboro, Kentucky. My sponsor was Terminal Transport, which was a company that uh, my father-in-law's company owned, trucking outfit out of Georgia, who hauled a lot of cars and stuff, new cars out of, out of Detroit. So I had Terminal Transport on the car. I'd gone down to the local, uh, my father-in-law had gone down to the local uh, Oldsmobile dealer and bought me a truck. Uh, it, was a, it was a coffee truck. Truck, Maxwell House coffee truck, and it was an old line truck that they had used. Old International is, it was kind of a piece of crap, but you know it, it worked for what I needed. And so I load everything I had in the back of that truck, and I had to head to Talladega. I meet Jake down there. We roll up the back door, and Jake looks in the back of the truck and he says, "Where's your tools?" <laughs> tools? What? I'd gone down to Western Auto. It's no lie. I went to Western Auto in Owensboro and bought a small uh, set of tools, things I thought we'd need. Uh, And I had uh, some tires that had come with the car and uh, I had no spare, I had no, I had no spare parts. And and I, and Jake, I thought he was just going to leave me right there. Just turn around, walk (laughs) away. But he said, all right, well, we're, we'll, we'll deal with it. So we unloaded the car, got through tech, everything went fine. Got in the race, and you may, Steve probably remembers this. I don't know, Ricky may not. That particular race was the race when Goodyear had decided instead of running the slick race, the tire that they'd been running there, they came with a treaded tire like they ran everywhere else. Well, that treaded tire turned out to be a problem. The guys could, Petty, Pearson, Alice, all those guys, they could run about 10 laps. Those tires would fly all to pieces. they come apart. The car I had and the tires I had for the car were the old Talladega slicks. So that's the tires we had. And Jake was mad about that from the very get-go. You're never going to be competitive running those old tires. Those old tires are junk. Nobody's running those tires. All the good guys are running the treaded tire. I said, that's all I got. It's like, I can't afford to buy anything. We're going to have to run these. So two guys had those same tires, me and James Hilton. So we started the race. (laughs) And I, I, you know, I'm a rookie. I don't know anything. I mean, I've been racing in Nashville, Salem, all the, I'm a short track punk. I'm a Talladega 2.6 mile super speedway. I never saw a track that big in my life. So what the hell am I doing here? But anyway, <laughs> they start the race. And the first thing you know, man, I just passed, I just passed David Pearson. I just passed Richard Petty. 
Where's that? I just passed Buddy Baker. What is wrong with these guys? I thought, oh my God. And Jake, you got to remember something. Now, Jake had a really bad reputation for being known as a cheater. So my first thought was, well, I guess they're going to kick me out because I know we must not have a plate. They must have left a restrictor plate off this motor because there's no way I could be passing those guys as easy as I was. I didn't know they were having tire trouble. So anyway, I end up, me and Hilton, and James Hilton end up in a heck of a race. Uh, I, I probably could have won that race if I hadn't had engine trouble, but late in the race I had engine trouble. Hilton went on to won the race, and uh, I left there thinking, this is a piece of cake. I mean, I go to my first race. I'm passing the big stars. Uh, I could have won this race. I, Manny, I'm, I'm on my way. And so 72 was really kind of a good year. We, we uh, Jake and I, uh, he came to work for me, and we, we ran, uh, I think, six or seven at Charlotte in the fall race. Uh, I think we had a couple of thirds at Nashville. So the car I had, the engines I had, and everything I had at the time were pretty good. And, uh, of course, I'm young, and what you don't know, you don't know. And I'd get out there, and, you know, I'd, I'd go like hell, and, and I did pretty well. So 72 was a great start, and I thought, this is exactly what I needed. This is what I built my – this is what my whole life I've been building up for this moment, for this – to be in the, in the Winston Cup Series – racing with the big stars. I've proven I can, I can compete. Uh, boy, am I going to have myself a ball. Well, <laughs> little did I know, uh, that was just the tip of the iceberg. 73, I, uh, I got in a I, – I, I, look, if I'm talking too much, tell me. But if, uh, if uh, I, I, I was always con- – I always consider myself an outsider. When I, when I came into the sport, my family, none of my family had ever raced. I, I wasn't an Earnhardt. I wasn't a Jared. I wasn't a Baker. I wasn't any of those father-son uh, acts that had previously, you know, been in the sport or helped build the sport. So I'm an outsider. I grew up in Owensboro, Kentucky. I lived in Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, I show up, uh, you know, and, and, and I think I'm pretty hot stuff because I've won a couple of track championships in Nashville. I'm the guy to beat when you come to Nashville. So. I'm pretty proud of what I've done and pretty proud of myself. And uh, people always say, well, you sure talked about yourself a lot. I said, well, I was afraid you weren't going to. <laughs> so I, I, I had a bad habit of, of, of – Shad Lick. You remember Shad Lick? Steve, does, I know. Oh, yeah. Play times. France wanted me to go out to, uh, to Ontario after we raced Ontario. Wanted me to go out to L.A. and have uh, dinner with Shad Lick. And I'll never forget this. And uh, Stevie and I were just talking about this yesterday. So I and, and I want to make a good impression because this guy's like one of the best writers in the country. Fresh for the L.A. Times. I mean, this guy's cool, older fella. So we're having dinner, and I sit down, and I guess I probably never shut up, kind of like now. And and so he it, finally we talk and we talk and we talk, and he asked me one question, and I, I don't I think it's only time he asked he asked one question. The rest <laughs> of I was off and running. So we sat for a long time, and finally I stopped and. He stopped, and we looked at each other, and he said, can I give you a little advice? I said, you go ahead. Everybody else does. Um, you know, I, I can take some advice. He said, you talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I do. <laughs> he said, you talk until you get yourself in trouble. He said, you need to learn how to answer the questions, and that's all, and don't add on or ad lib or any of those other things that you seem to be pretty good at. Just answer the questions, and you'll be a whole lot better off. I wish I had to listen to him. That was a good <laughs> I, I, I wish I'd have taken that advice, but you know me, uh, young and dumb and energetic, and felt like I had to had to prove myself all the time. And I did talk a lot. I will I will admit that. But I have to say that people said I talked a lot, but you got to remember those other guys didn't talk any. That's yeah. true. You know, That's guys, true. How's your, car? How's your car? Oh, it's good. How do you think you'll do? That? I think I'll do all right. You know, they were they were one liners, and that was it. But I had a tendency to, you know, never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. So <laughs> well, that's how I don't know if I didn't, I don't even know what question you asked me. Now I forgot. But anyway, <laughs> you answered it. I got to Mercury, and that's when I went to Talladega, and that was the beginning of my career. Daryl, nineteen seventy three, you did run a handful of races for Bud Moore later in yeah. the season. Did you yeah. know going in that that was going to be a limited deal or were you maybe hoping for a more long-term program with them? Yeah, I thought, again, I thought, I, you know, I thought, well, this is a Bud Moore 
famous car builder. Uh, Bobby Isaac had been driving the car. Uh, Bud was in with Ford Motor Company. And so when Bud wanted me to drive his car, I thought, well, this is a great opportunity I've been looking for. Uh, I, I don't have to spend my own money. I can go drive somebody else's car and, uh, and, and hopefully, you know, things will work out. Bud told me when I went to drive the car, I think he had stay power, which I don't know what that was, some oil additive, uh, that, that was a temporary sponsor. And Bud said to me, he said, if we can find a sponsor for you for next year, then we're going to run you next year. Well, I was, I was so happy about that and excited. Uh, but things didn't work out at all with me and Bud. Uh, we were totally opposites. Um, I had a tendency to kind of know what I wanted and what I liked and what I didn't like. And Bud was just, he was the same way. I'll give you a good example. Bobby Isaac been driving the car. Bobby's a pretty small guy. I go down to Bud's to get suited, to get fitted up in the car to go to Darlington. That was our first race, Southern 500. And uh, I, I, I get in, the, I try to get in the car. I can't get in the seat. I mean, this seat is a little, it's a real narrow and it's real tight and I can barely squeeze into it. And I told Bud, I said, Bud, we're going to have to change this seat. Hell no, we ain't changing that seat. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you? I said, well, it's not big enough. I, 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 Bobby was, he was a little bigger than, he was a little smaller than me and I. I just, I can't get myself back in this seat. I'm not comfortable. Well, you're going to have to learn to be comfortable in that seat because Ford Motor Company spent thousands of dollars developing that seat. It's got the lumbar support. It's got this. It's got that. And I, so you're just going to have to deal with that seat. I said, all right, all right, I'll do it. So we get the seat. And I get kind of halfway comfortable in it. Then I get, I got to have Isaac's helmet because it had radios in it. I didn't have radios. So I got this helmet. I'm a seven and a three eighths, maybe a seven and a half. This is a seven and a quarter helmet. Ooh. <laughs> so I'm trying to get this helmet on my head. And I said, but I'm, I'm not going to be able to use this helmet. What the hell are you talking about, boy? <laughs> no, but it's just a little too tight. It doesn't fit good. I can't get it down. He said, well, you're just going to have to learn how to deal with that helmet. Because that helmet has got the radios in it. And I got to be able to talk to you. I said, okay, okay. So now I got a seat I don't fit in. I got a helmet that's giving me a headache and I hadn't even gone out on the track yet. And I got Bud Moore and you know, Bud, Steve does. I know. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. He was, he was chewing my butt out before I, I haven't even left the garage yet. And he's all <laughs> on my case about how to drive the car, where to run on the track, and blah, 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 blah. Never just constant. So we get, we qualified second. I think Bobby was on pole. And Allison, I think I was second, or we were third and fourth. Anyway, I was on the outside. Bud grabs me by the collar like I always did back in the day, and he said, boy, listen to me. Don't you go in that third turn on the outside of anybody. I said, okay. He said, you go, on, you go in that third turn on the outside of somebody, they're going to put you in the wall. I said, okay, okay, I got it. Don't go on the outside of anybody in the third turn. I got it. So we come around, they drop the green flag, and we go down the back straight away. And I'm side by side with Bobby Allison. And I'm thinking, <laughs> he'll lift. He'll lift. He'll, he, he's got to lift. I'm going to drive in this corner, and, and he's going to lift, and I'm going to swoop down in front of him. Don't go, in that, don't go on the outside of anybody in that third turn. I've already been lectured about that. Well, guess what? Bobby didn't lift, and I didn't lift, and Bobby put me in the wall on the first lap of the race. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that work That's out way, for you? <laughs> that was the way – that was my relationship with Bud Moore. It never got much better than that. Uh, we wrecked a couple of times. We blew up a couple of times. Had a couple of pretty good, pretty good races. By the way, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I probably created the biggest fire. Yes, Rich been in racing yeah. at Richmond. Yeah. Uh, Baxter Price spun out like first, second, third lap of the race. I'm following. Bobby's Alice is leading the race. I'm running second, going down the back, and I'm I'm all over the back of Bobby. And we get into third and fourth turn, and Bobby turns on the pit road. I said, what is wrong with that big dummy? I, well, what was wrong with him was a car sitting crossways in the track. It was Baxter Price. <laughs> I nailed him. And when I did, I mean, it exploded. The fire, I mean, cars crashed, cars on fire. Every, I mean, it, it like, scared me to death. I'd never been in a fire before. And you know what was the worst part? Bud Moore on the radio. Boy. Well, get out of that car and get that damn radio before you come back over here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to get out alive. He tells me to get the damn radio before we get out of there. So anyway, we, I, I, 
I later on, Bud and I became great friends. I love Bud more, but that was not a good experience for DW. Well, after that, were you actively looking for another ride, or were you content to run your own stuff? Oh, I just went. I went back and I re. I kind of uh, regrouped, and uh, in '74, uh, got my team back together with uh, Harry Hyde and the K and K team. They had folded, so I had a lot of really, really good people. Robert G was my uh, kind of fabricator body man. Jake was my crew chief. Larry Reagan. Ray Fox was doing, Junior was doing our engines. We were all racing out of Robert's shop there on Huspeth Road and uh, started off the 74 season with my own team, my own cars. And uh, and, and actually went, it, it went really well for a underfunded team. See, that was, that was the other thing. Because my father-in-law was the president of Texas Gas, well, everybody thought I had a lot of money. And so they didn't know how, how, how I struggled to make it, how I had to, Right, I had to write bad checks and borrow money. I'd pay Jake on Friday and borrow the money back on Monday. Uh, it was just, it was, it was, it was a, it was a terrible situation I found myself in. Had I, I could run with these guys, I could beat these guys, but I didn't have the money to keep up with these guys. I didn't have the deep pockets, and so the end of '74, we started the '75 season, and. Uh, I was struggling, man. I had no money. I was broke. Uh, I, Huggins would sell me. Bless, bless, bless the Huggins guys. They took care of me. They gave me. They let me have tires and pay them when I could. Dick Hutchinson helped me a bunch. Uh, a lot of people helped me. Robert G. I, I mean, I, I couldn't have made it without Robert and uh, Jake and that whole crowd. But uh, along in the middle of '75, and I, I think you probably remember this. Uh, I I, w- I ran really well, and uh, that's when Diegard had come on the scene uh, with Donnie Allison, and Donnie was driving for Diegard, and they were based in Daytona. And, and uh, I I'll never forget this: it was a Fourth of July race, Daytona, and uh, I passed Donnie on the last lap to finish third or fourth. And it, and Bill Gardner was so upset with Donnie that he let me pass him because I'm underfunded, I'm a rookie, I don't know anything. He's spending all this money. He's got this veteran, Donnie Allison, and this kid from Tennessee blows by him on the last lap and beat, finishes him. He fired Donnie on the spot, and uh, I didn't know all this until later. So Stevie and I, uh, her mom and dad had a house down in Vero Beach, Florida. So we left Daytona and went to Vero, spent a couple of days down there, came back up to Daytona to pick up my check, and I stopped in the Daytona office, and they said, have you seen Jim Gardner? I said, I don't even know who Jim Gardner is. Well, that's Bill Gardner's brother, and uh, they're looking for you. I said, they are looking for me? I, what, what did I do? No, no, no. They want to hire you. They want to hire me? Are you kidding me? I'm better than they are. I got a better car than they do. I outrun them every week. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be – I'm don't. i not interested. So, well, just know Jim Gardner's looking for you. Would you not believe – and, Steve, you know how these things go. Yeah. Steve and I are going to drive – back from Daytona to Charlotte. We stopped in a gas station to get some gas, and guess who was in the same gas station? Jim Gardner. Was he really? He was. <laughs> and so he said, where have you been? We've been trying to get in touch with you. We want to hire you. I said, well, I'm not interested. I said, you're not interested? I said, no, 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 no. I got a pretty good team. I'm, things are starting to work pretty good for me. Uh, you guys got a lot of problems. Mario Rossi was the engine guy. Good man. I love Mario, but, you know, had a lot of engine problems. Anyway, we get in our cars and we leave at the gas station. And Stevie's in the car and she said, what did he want? I said, ah, it's Bill Gardner's brother. And he wanted me to come drive their car. And he said, and she said, she got all excited. So what would you tell him? I said, well, I told him I wasn't interested. She said, you turn this car around right now. You go <laughs> you go him. Are you crazy? you got to go drive for them. That's, we don't have any money. We're broke. We're week to week. And, and you can go drive for somebody else, and you don't have to worry about all that. So, anyway, we talked about all the way back to Charlotte. And finally, I got to Charlotte, and I called them. And I said, you know, I thought that over. And um, actually, I'm pretty interested. So, the middle of 75, I went to drive for Diegard. And uh, then I stayed there through the end of 75. And then we got the Gatorade deal. And uh, – Moved the team from Daytona to Charlotte. Robert Yates came to work for us. A lot of Buddy Parrott, David F., a lot of good people. And, uh, and and once again, we were rolling. I won 29 races, 
almost won the 79 championship driving for them. And uh, it was a tumultuous relationship, but we had good people. We had good cars, good motors, but uh, I just, I didn't, I wasn't happy there. Uh, I, I wanted to get, I wanted to get away from there and, and things just didn't work out. Wasn't Bill's fault, wasn't Jim's fault, wasn't anybody's fault. We just weren't meant for each other. Well, back up a little bit. You got your first win in May of 75 right. at Nashville. Right. How big a deal was that for you? I mean, oh, right man. there in Nashville. Well, of course, everybody, that was my home track. Uh, yeah. I'd do track championships there. I'd won about 60, 70, I don't know, a lot of feature races. So that was my home track. Uh, I'd won a USAC race there, a USAC stock car race there, beat all the big USAC stars. Uh, John Cock, Hunter, I don't know, a whole bunch of them are here for that race. Hartman, that was all the, all the hot shots from USAC. So we won a USAC race there. And uh, then that race was so fun because it was Mother's Day weekend. One of my all-time favorite pictures uh, is Victory Lane. And Stevie and I and, and Jake and Robert, all my team, and little Michael, my, my little brother, he's standing down her left front corner of the car, all got the kinky hair, hairdo. And, uh, and that was my first win. And uh, I was so happy because my grandmother had taken me to races when I was six years old in Owensboro. Her favorite driver was G.C. Spencer. I was a big G.C. Spencer fan. And so my grandmother took me to a lot of races before I started racing. And so it was so – so gratifying and so felt so good that my grandmother, my grandfather, my mom, my dad, my whole family were there. And it was Mother's Day weekend and we won that race. And the next day we went over to the park and had a big cookout. And uh, it, you'd, you'd have thought I won the Daytona 500, which it kind of felt like that to me. But that was my first win and, and one I'll never forget. DW, I have always considered Stevie to be one of the classiest women who ever yep. stepped foot in the NASCAR garage. And you've already mentioned the fact that you like to talk and <laughs> it, there were times that you made people mad with what you were saying. There was the whole Kale Yarbrough jaws incident. There was Richard Petty. There was Bobby Allison. Yeah. All those years when you would say something that made somebody mad, what were the conversations with her? Like once you got home, was she like now Daryl? <laughs> what were those conversations like? It usually wasn't before I got home. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many times I'd be doing an interview and I'd be mouthing off about something and she'd be standing over in the background. I could see her and she'd be shaking her hand, shaking her head, saying, no, 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 don't say that. Stop, stop now. But I couldn't help myself. And I, you know, I felt like, I always felt like I was a, 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 a little fish in a big sea. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, I, I figured out and I, and I, I kind of knew that the media was my best friend. Uh, if, if the other, the, literally, and, and I mean, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but the other guys, they really didn't have, they didn't talk. Uh, they, they, they didn't have opinions about anything. They were all scared of NASCAR. They were afraid to be too outspoken. And I didn't really care. Uh, you know, I figured what the hell I'm, I may or may not be here forever. I just don't know. And so I, 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 I I always felt like the best way for me to make people make people know who I was uh, was was to talk to the media, and so uh, you know, and the media knew that, and it was you know Wade and Higgins and and uh, Cat from down there went to Salem and four Mulher. five, yeah yeah Mulher, <laughs> four five of them would all you know we'd all go play they play cards and, and uh, Jake and Herb and Bud and all of them would play cards with them and so. The media was my friends, and uh, and and so I I used the media a lot uh, to send messages. Sometimes I'd send a message to Kale or Richard or Bobby or whomever, and sometimes I'd send a message to uh, Bill France Jr. <laughs> Bill, Kale, Bobby, Richard, none of those guys ever called me, but now Bill France Jr. He would call you. I'll never forget. So we're somewhere. I don't know. They made a rule, and it, it was directly related. It was something that affected me. And I was so upset about it. Monday morning, I get on the phone. I call I off and call Bill Francis off. He answered the phone. I said, Bill, I want to know who the dumbass was that made that rule. He said, you're talking to him. <laughs> 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 so anyway, I, I, 
I didn't mean I, it, when I look back on my career and I look back at some of the things I said and did, uh, I, I'd probably had to whip that guy's ass. I'm just telling you, because it just it, a lot of things were they, it was obnoxious. Uh, it was sometimes over the top, and I regret sometimes some of the things I said or I never did anything on the racetrack that was bad. It was just mostly off the track comments I'd make about Earnhardt or, you know, somebody that they were probably in hindsight, not the right thing to do, but that's who I was. Well, Daryl, I let you, <clears throat> let you know something there. Media back then knew exactly what you were doing and we <laughs> loved it. <laughs> we loved it. But back well, to, <laughs> back wait, to racing. You, you wait, racing. No, wait, you'd yeah. know, you know, like Richard or Bobby or David or whoever win the race, and the headlines it would be Waltrip said. <laughs> <laughs> Man, the, they are athletes that we call good copy, and you were good copy. We went looking for you back <laughs> in those days. But back to the race in 1977, you had a really good year with yeah. it. it turned out to be the best at that point. Six wins, fourth in the standings. Hey. I know your relationship with the gardeners might not have been all that good, but what was the difference here? We moved. Uh, when, wow. I went, when I went to work for them, uh, when, when I started driving for them, they were based in Daytona. Bill Gardner knew nothing about racing. Uh, he and his, son, uh, he and his brother-in-law, uh, Mike DiPresparo, I think that's how you say it. That's where the die, D-I, and the guard, Gardner, DiPresparo, and Gardner, they combined that to make die guard. So, and, and uh, uh, the press pro had a wreck and he, uh, I think he ended up in a, in a coma or something happened to him. And so he, he was, he couldn't be involved with the race team and Bill sort of inherited the race team and Bill, he knew nothing. Bill was a banker. He was a businessman from New, from Connecticut. So he didn't know a lot about the sport. And, uh, and, and, and so he thought being in Daytona, because that's where the headquarters is, if he had a race team, he'd need to be near the headquarters. And so we had a shop down on Pinterest Boulevard, or they did, uh, just a few blocks from the, from the NASCAR offices. He thought that was a big advantage. I thought that was a big disadvantage. Personally, I wanted to get as far away from him as I could myself. <laughs> in most cases, uh, to, I needed some breathing room. But anyway... So I went to work for him, and Mario Rossi was the engine guy. Robert Yates and I had become good friends, and uh, I finally convinced uh, Gardner that the only way we're ever going to be successful is we got to move to Charlotte because that's where all the car, that's where all the people are, uh, that's where that's that's the hub, and we need to get out of Daytona. We were we were a day we were a day or two behind every time we went somewhere. We'd have to drive from Daytona to wherever, Darlington, Charlotte. It didn't matter where we went. We were always like a day behind, and had to get the car there and then had to get the car home. And had, so our truck was on the road all the time and uh, it just, it just wasn't working out. So we bought a, uh, a shop over by the uh, Charlotte airport near home in the Moody. And uh, that's when all the good people, that's when Buddy Parrott, David Hill, Jay, Robert Yates, Ducky knew. I mean, we had, we had some good people and uh, 77 we moved and things picked up and we started winning races, had a pretty good year in 78. 79 was our year. Uh, we, and to Bill Gardner's credit, he gave us everything we needed uh, to win that championship. And uh, I, only problem was uh, I short-circuited a couple of times. And, and maybe, you know, we had some things happen that, that, we, that shouldn't have happened that we could have avoided. Bobby wrecked me at Wilkesboro. Uh, I wrecked myself at Darlington. I had a huge point lead over Richard. And I, I was I was so I was so determined to beat Richard Petty and to beat all those guys. You know that old you know was it Ric Flair say to be the man you got to beat the man. Well, that that was that was how I felt. The only way I'm ever going to be respected in this sport is I, I got to beat these guys. I got to beat them good, and uh, I ended up beating myself. And in Darling and Darlington really was the worst race. The Southern Five Hundred. Pearson was driving, I think, Earnhardt's car or yeah. Donnie's car or somebody. And uh, I lapped him. With 50 laps to go, David Pearson, the Silver Fox, the King of Darlington, and I lapped him. He was running second. And I lapped him. And I thought, ha, 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 
I am showing out today. I'm showing these boys how it's done. And Buddy <laughs> and David F. are screaming at me on the radio, you've got to slow down. You're going to wreck. You're going to hit. You've got to back off. And, I, and I, I'll never forget, I came out and said, you two knuckleheads, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. And about two laps later, guess what? where I was? <laughs> In the wall. Wow. And, and so that – it was kind of demoralizing uh, because it, I kind of did it to myself. So I made it – it was the best thing that ever happened to it. It was the worst thing at the time, but I think it turned out to be the best thing because I made a commitment that day after that race. I was never going to beat myself again because I didn't – nobody beat me. I beat myself. Mm. And so I, I wrote it on my dashboard. I, 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 I had – everywhere I could look, I said – I would write, don't beat yourself. And how many guys have we seen do that through the years? And, and that was a good lesson for me. And Richard won that championship by 11 points. Uh, and it taught me a good lesson. 